Welcome to Modern Medicine. Today we have the honor of a special guest, Dr. John Chalik, who's a distinguished neurologist here in Schuylkill County, and he's going to join us for a discussion of Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism and the difference between the two. Um, and the reason I sec uh, selected this uh, topic was because of Robin Williams' recent diagnosis or disclosure of his diagnosis to the public and his tragic suicide. John, welcome to Modern Medicine. Thanks for joining us. And before we start with the discussion, could you tell us a little bit about your background, your medical education, and what brought you to Schuylkill County? Dave, I'm happy to, happy to divulge that information. Uh, and I love being referred to as a distinguished neurologist. I, ever since I got the gray hair and the white hair and the dark, you know, the gray beard, distinguished has been applied to me. I don't know that, hopefully that applies to my skills in the neurological field, but I was, did my undergraduate education, as you know, down the river from you. You were at MIT, which is a really excellent college. I was at that inferior liberal arts school, Harvard, down the river. Uh, had a great time there, and actually that was where I um, developed my interest in the brain. Uh, there were a lot of discoveries going on at that time on localization of function to different parts of the brain. One part of the brain that would control movement, one part that would control language, another part controlling uh, behaviors, another part controlling vision. There was a lot of excitement going on in that field. I studied it in college, uh, had the opportunity to go over to Harvard Medical School and hear some of the pioneers in brain localization, what's called behavioral neurology, higher cortical functions, hear them lecture, talk about all these amazing things. You could put electrodes in a certain part of a cat's brain and turn the cat into this vicious animal, and then you can turn on the stimulation and the cat would be shrieking at you, you turn it off, the cat was docile like this, and it was just fascinating stuff. So I started out at Harvard, moved on to Johns Hopkins, uh, was at University of Penn doing research actually in brain aging, dementia studies, and was recruited here by a couple of individuals that had connections to Schuylkill County, Norman Wall, Dr. Wall, who is a legendary physician from the area, really was instrumental in bringing me up to Schuylkill County 25 years ago, and I haven't looked back since. Came up, enjoyed the area, loved the people, uh, fascinated by my patients. Hopefully I'm helping them out a great deal. Uh, we collaborate on neuro-oncology issues. Uh, so it's been a great 25-year ride. John, um, I'm gonna tip my hat to the late Dr. Norm Wall also, because he's part of the reason why I'm practicing radiation oncology in this uh, wonderful area of the country. And when we were coming up with the name for this show, I was talking to Sam Lasant, and I said, Sam, why don't we call it the go-to guys? Because, John, I regard you as one of the go-to guys in our community in neurology. And people do not have to run down to Philadelphia, run over to Lehigh Valley or up to Geisinger. We have the expertise right here in county. And again, thank you for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Great. Okay, well, uh, we want to talk about uh, Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism. And could you distinguish uh, those two entities uh, for us, John? Well, I'm going to start by kind of, to a certain degree, discounting Parkinsonism. Um, the, and you're in politics, as I think some of the people in our audience know. In um, politics, but not a politician. Right. Um, but in, in the political world, isms became a bad word, especially around the time of World War II. We had communism, fascism, uh, you know, all the, the isms were bad. Um, Parkinsonism is a term that I do not use very often. I think it's much more interesting to talk about Parkinson's disease. Parkinsonism means that something is like Parkinson's disease, but it's not exactly the disease itself. And the disease is really much more interesting to discuss, to discuss advances in, um, and, and really to Michael J. Fox, 
an example of somebody with Parkinson's disease. Robin Williams, from what we hear, had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease shortly before his unfortunate suicide. So that's the disease, and I, I think that's more important. Parkinsonism uh, will refer, for instance, to people that are on certain medications that cause symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease, but it's not the disease itself. Well, John, um, how would you classify Muhammad Ali, again, who had a connection to our county with his training camp in Deer Lake? That's a very good question, and he would fall in the category of a, a, a we would say a Parkinsonian disorder or a degenerative brain disease with Parkinson features. Uh, Parkinsonism certainly could be used loosely to describe that, uh, but uh, not the typical Parkinson's disease that is exemplified by Michael J. Fox, for example. Well, now, specifically for Michael J. Fox, in reviewing his case history, if you will, he was diagnosed in 1991. John, that was 23 years ago. Is his uh, course uh, typical? In many ways, it is typical. And one of the things that I learned very early on was that if Parkinson's disease is well treated, and we do have good treatments for Parkinson's disease now, that uh, the lifespan of the patient with Parkinson's disease can be expanded and can start approximating the lifespan of somebody normal and healthy who does not have the disease. So he is somewhat of a typical case, but one of the things about Parkinson's disease is that every patient has a slightly different course, every patient has a slightly different profile. We can look at, if, when we look at the hallmark symptoms of Parkinson's disease, we think of tremor, and the tremor is typically a resting tremor. When patients are relaxed, they tend to shake like this, okay. kind of move their hands, their thumbs a little bit. I the remember from medical pill, school. Pill rolling tremor, they call it. Yes. Um, and the tremor of Parkinson's disease is, outside of a cosmetic appearance, is not usually that debilitating, in that when somebody with Parkinson's disease goes to do things, their hands will settle down. So they can hold a cup, drink from a cup, have a sip of a cup of water, yeah. their hands are not shaking, they put the cup down, they relax, yeah. and their hands start back. going. Uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and the signs that are more disabling are rigidity and Parkinson's. Lack of movement. Lack of, well, actually, they're two different things. Rigidity is an increase in tone, which makes it difficult to move the muscles and the tendons. And then we talk about another hallmark feature which is called bradykinesia or akinesia, and that means slow movement or lack of movement. So those, we, we really separate those two, although they often go hand in hand. So we have the tremor, the resting tremor. We have the uh, slowing of movements or the relative immobility. We have the increased tone, which is the rigidity, which leads to difficulty moving and also pain, which can be a feature of Parkinson's disease. The and then we have an abnormal gait, a, a walking disorder that Parkinson patients get. And we have seen, and it really has become kind of the caric caricature of old people when they walk, the hunched over yes. appearance, the short steps, and the propensity to falls. And that really is one of the worst symptoms of Parkinson's disease is this inability to maintain balance leading to falls, injuries, hip fractures, a lot of bad things. Well, John, at this point, we're gonna take a commercial break, but when we come back, we'll focus on some of these early warning signs for the uh, guests and the uh, viewers in the audience. Happy to do it. Welcome back to Modern Medicine. Our guest today is Dr. John Chalik, and I'll use the term again, an exemplary uh, neurologist practicing here in Schuylkill County. John, welcome again, and we had just uh, talked about some of the classic signs of Parkinson's disease. What I'd like to ask you next is what early signs might uh, members of the viewing audience 
need to look out for so that a, they could uh, seek at medical attention from the, the family physician, an internal medicine physician, and then get referred for neurologic evaluation. Well, one of the things that I'm, I'd like to mention in that regard is this issue of tremor because it's common for many people and also as people get older and by the way Parkinson's disease is a disease that becomes much more prevalent as people age not very common in people under age 50 uh, fairly common in people over age 80 uh, so it is a disorder of aging as people age they also get a little bit shaky uh, surgeons, for example, when they're in their 30s and 40s have great surgical skills. Some, unfortunately, when they get into their 80s are a little bit too shaky like this to perform their surgeries. Um, others actually perform surgeries fine until their 80s. But people that develop tremors, the most common tremors that we see are called essential tremors. We call them essential tremors because essentially everybody has it. If you hold your arms outstretched, if you look at me, if you put a little a piece of paper on my hands, you see the paper moving. Um, and that's why I'm an, a neurologist and not a neurosurgeon, because I have that little bit of tremor. It's not disabling in any way. There are people that develop those tremors that can become quite disabled. Uh, they will go to drink from a glass of water, and as they come up to their mouth, it starts shaking so violently they spill all over themselves. They can't go out to dinner. They, but those people don't have Parkinson's disease. We talked about Parkinson's being the resting tremor. So for the family doctors, often what happens is that patients present with tremor, and at that point they get referred to the neurologist, and oftentimes we can reassure patients and say you have this benign essential tremor, and it's not Parkinson's disease. Many patients at that point are, point are relieved and they don't really require any further treatment. Uh, they cut back on their caffeine a little bit, they mm -hmm. eat meals on a more regular basis, cut down their stress level, and their tremors do fine. Uh, other individuals, however, that have these resting tremors are most likely in early stages of Parkinson's disease. And if we look back on Michael J. Fox uh, in his acting career, and if you look at clips from his television shows and movies, when he was in those early stages of Parkinson's disease, his typical posture was his hand in his pocket. Mm -hmm. If he had his hand outside, he'd have that resting tremor. If he stuck his hand in his pocket, that would hide the tremor. It would hide the tremor. Uh, so we talk actually about two different forms sometimes of Parkinson's disease. We talk about the tremor predominant form and the rigidity and bradykinetic or lack of movement form. The tremor predominant form is a more benign form of the disease. And I think that's one reason that Michael J. Fox, now 20 Three years. some years yeah. after his diagnosis, is acting on television. I mean, he clearly has issues related to his movement disorder. And when you watch him, he has kind of these extra movements that are typical for the effects of the medications and some of the treatments that we use for Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's otherwise fairly functional. I mean, he can move and he can talk and he can act. Uh, Speech, and, mind. Yes, is intact. Uh, well, John, uh, along the lines of other tremor diagnoses, I've heard the term familial tremor. Yes. How does that distinguish from an essential tremor? Um, essential tremor will often run in families in a very strong fashion, uh, what we call autosomal dominant, where several members of one generation will have it, several members of the next generation will have it, uh, and, but that is otherwise a form of benign essential tremor. Uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, we're learning that there, as with all of the neurodegenerative disorders, that there are genetic components but they're not as strong as the genetic component in essential tremor, for instance. Mm -hmm. Well, now, John, let's say the family physician and the internal medicine physician suspect an early diagnosis of Parkinsonism, and they'll ask your opinion or the other fine neurologists in the community. Um, are there any specific tests that can nail down the diagnosis of Parkinsonism? For the longest time, our 
we, we would say that the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease was a clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And we would go down that checklist. We would look for tremor. Is it a resting tremor or is it a benign tremor? We would look at the tone. And that's something that we assess. We have patients, we actually hold the patient's arm up and we move the arm back and forth like that, and especially the wrist. And when you have Parkinson's disease, instead of a smooth movement at the wrist, you get this little catch. It's kind of a ratchety feeling, and we call that cogwheeling. Mm -hmm. And it's something that a skilled clinician becomes adept at picking up on examination and is extremely helpful in nailing a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In terms of the lack of movement, we see some generalized slowing of movement and also, or often if you just ask patients and families the questions about symptoms, even if they come in with just tremor, you say, well, has their voice changed? They'll say, yes, the voice has gotten weaker, a little bit harder to understand, maybe slurring a little bit. We'll say, well, has there been a change in how the patient walks. Well, yeah, he hunches over a little bit. His steps are not as large as they used to be. And he doesn't swing his arms. And that's another feature of Parkinson's disease. They keep the arms at the side and don't have a normal arm movement. Uh, another feature is a change in handwriting, what we call micrographia, where the handwriting gets smaller. Now, people with essential tremor will often have problems with their writing because their hand gets real shaky. Um, but the handwriting itself is the same size. Patients with Parkinson's disease will develop smaller handwriting, but otherwise the handwriting will stay fairly legible, maybe a little bit of resting tremor superimposed. John, do you ever ask for handwriting samples, say in checks that have been uh, signed over the last seven years or something? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, we look at that. Um, but it's something actually that observant family members notice, the, the spouse, will often be able to sit there and say, you know, his handwriting got smaller. And I don't, I don't say, has your handwriting got smaller? I say, has there been a change in your handwriting? Open-ended question. Right, and then the patient or the spouse says, yeah, you know, over the past couple of years, it's gotten smaller. And that, to me, is very strongly suggestive. Uh, with the movement, what happens is that the facial expressivity goes away. Um, and is this the mask? The, the, that, they call the mask the masked faces, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of like, not like Jim Carrey, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the mask faces where uh, patients just don't seem to be animated when you look at them. Maybe a little bit like the, um, the Botox yes. look. Okay. You know, um, but they don't blink at a normal rate. Mm -hmm. So they have this stare, uh, this paucity, this short shortage of normal facial movements. And a lot of times when I see a patient come into the office, uh, I can make the diagnosis in the first 30 seconds. Really? They yeah. sit down, they're shaking like this with their hands, yeah. rolling the pill a little bit, and their face is not moving, eyes not blinking, and you know, I, I know we're dealing with at least Parkinsonism, and yeah. then when I look at medications, if it's yeah. not a medication-induced, then we're dealing with Parkinson's disease. I think disease. the German physicians would call that an Augenblick uh, diagnosis, a blink of the eye that you make across right. the, across in, the in room. Right, in a moment like that, absolutely. Well, John, we're going to take another commercial break. When we come back, I'd like to talk to you about prognosis and treatment and advances in treatment. Absolutely. Welcome back to Modern Medicine, and today's topic is Parkinson's disease. I have uh, with us Dr. John Chalik of the Neurology Service here in Schuylkill County. John, uh, a couple of questions remain on the management of Parkinson's disease and also the diagnosis. I'm a therapeutic radiologist, but of course radiology is very important to management of cancer. What, are, what would be the role of our various scanning technologies in pinpointing a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? Well, in the early stages of Parkinson's disease, a typical MRI scan done uh, anywhere in the United States or in the world will really not show very much. Um, and that's helpful because there is a form of Parkinsonism that we refer to called vascular Parkinson's disease where you have small strokes 
-hmm. in parts of the brain that are important for normal motor function and strokes in those areas can cause symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease. So we do the MRI scan to rule out that scenario. Uh, John, are yes. diabetics any more prone to that form of uh, Parkinson uh, dysfunction uh, than other people with vascular disease? Um, yes, because their disease often affects the smaller blood vessels in the brain. Uh, but it, it also, it, it's not very common to see vascular Parkinsonism because you really have to get lesions in the wrong areas of the brain and there's a lot of brain tissue that's not going to be involved uh, with Parkinson's disease that's going to be affected in those scenarios. Uh, another um, reason to do an MRI scan, and this is very rare, but there are reports and as an oncologist of tumors, brain tumors, that occur in parts of the brain that are important for normal movement. And tumors in those areas can mimic Parkinson's disease. So we do an MRI scan of the brain, and that's really the reason we do it, to rule out tumor, to rule out stroke as a cause of the Parkinson's disease. There's a new nuclear medicine scan um, done with SPECT, which is similar to PET, um, and it's a scan um, using radioactive iodine to label dopamine transporter protein. Um, dopamine is the brain chemical that's deficient in Parkinson patients. The treatment that we give patients is basically giving them dopamine in some form. So we can see if there is a deficiency in DAT, it's called, it's a DAT scan. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be a very early sign of Parkinson's disease. In fact, when you look at uh, early stages or premonitory stages of Parkinson's disease, uh, there are individuals, and we talked about this before the show, individuals that may have a loss of the sense of smell mm -hmm. and they may have depression before they develop any of the motor evidence for Parkinson's disease that we talked about as being the typical symptomatology. So there is a movement afoot now to look at people that are in their 40s, 50s with loss of sense of smell, uh, depression, and do DAT scans on those patients and see if you can detect this dopamine deficiency before it gets to the point where they actually have the motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease. So that's a, de a development in the past couple of years. John, can I ask you to speculate in the case of Robin Williams? You know, obviously committing suicide is an intense expression of uh, depression. Could that have been related to his underlying disease process, which came first? the uh, cart or the horse? That's a very good question. Uh, there are studies suggesting that the depression in Parkinson's disease can precede the disease by 10 years. Uh, we don't know how long Robin Williams was wrestling with depression, but my understanding was a pretty long time. And also these uh, entertainers, performers, actors, uh, comedians uh, often have a lot of psychological baggage that goes along with their talent and their skills and so it, I, I think it's a hard call. Uh, I know that there were some comments made saying that being put on Parkinson medications put him over the edge and contributed to the suicide. I would take issue with that. Well now John can you wind things up by giving us an overview of uh, treatment of Parkinson's disease uh, standard and then what's on the horizon that sounded very exciting. The standard treatment has been a form of dopamine, actually a precursor of dopamine called levodopa, which was introduced in the 1960s. Again, referring to Robin Williams, a wonderful movie, if you folks haven't seen it, Awakenings it's called, oh, it's where right. Robin Williams plays a, a neurologist, very well-known neurologist who wrote, wrote the book as a study of patients who had Parkinson's disease and were institutionalized and were given the levodopa, the L-dopa as we call it, and they woke up. They came out of the stupor and became virtually normal individuals. And that medication developed in the 1960s has been a mainstay of John, treatment. What an irony. You Absolutely. just pointed out to me. Yeah. Absolutely. Robin Williams involved. Um, more recently, there's exciting work being done 
Uh, there's a technique called deep brain stimulation where a wire that is uh, much, much smaller than a pinhead um, is placed inside the brain in a specific structure of the brain and the wire has uh, different points that can be electrically stimulated and there are ways you can activate the part of the brain that no longer is being activated normally and uh, get rid of the symptoms and signs of Parkinson's disease without medication. At this stage, deep brain stimulation is being done in later uh, patients, patients who have had the disease for a longer period of time. It's actually a way, now I'm not sure with Michael J. Fox because he had a surgery done to destroy brain cells in the part of the brain that was responsible for the Parkinson's disease. And I'm not sure that you can then superimpose deep brain stimulation into one of those lesions. Uh, but we talk about Michael J. Fox and these extraneous extra movements that he has, which comes from over medication in a sense, but allows him to be mobile. Um, we can eliminate that with deep brain stimulation because we don't have to use those medications in nonspecific ways. We can now stimulate the exact target of the brain that needs to control the tremor, the rigidity, the lack of movement. And we do that with a neurosurgical procedure that is relatively safe, relatively easy to perform, and, uh, and very exciting. Has developed over the past uh, 10 to 15 years, being done uh, very uh, well at various neurological and neurosurgical centers in this general area at Hershey, uh, Lehigh Valley, at Geisinger uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, very exciting field. And now they're working on a way to put a lesion in the brain in a much less crude fashion than, um, and no offense to uh, radio, uh, uh, radio surgical oncologists, uh, but where, where you can do it to a much tinier area of the brain and you use an MRI machine to localize where you want to put the lesion and then you use targeted ultrasound which can uh, basically work like a mini microwave and just target a tiny eliminate area of the brain small. and uh, eliminate the area that's responsible for the Parkinson's disease. Which by the way is a technique that is also going to become very, very uh, important for treating tumors of the brain. I look um, forward to that. And John, I want to thank you for joining us on Modern Medicine. I hope to have you back again in the near future so we could talk about other entities that are on the cutting edge of neurology, such as multiple sclerosis and, um, you know, just to mention one. I'd be happy to do that, and I look forward to t uh, talking to my future congressman uh, in that capacity. John, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.